The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're on the Goliad Paddling Trail on the San Antonio River. You don't have to be a skilled kayaker in order to enjoy the river. There's ability to go home at night feeling like I've made a difference, however small, in my corner of the world. I try to generate an image that somehow captures the feeling of the place. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. We're on the Goliad Paddling Trail on the San Antonio River. It's uh, up a little bit kind of fast compared to what it usually is, but nice. It's a little green out here. Yeah, it's a little green. A lot of Katie dids. We do have a paddling trail here, and we were actually the first state park to have a paddling trail uh, site designated inside a state park. This is a wide river, it really is. It's about 6.1 miles of a beautiful, pristine river. The site here in our park is the takeout site. The other developed areas to get on the paddling trail are north of our park. So once you get to the park, people have to get off the river unless they want to continue to float with no easy access to get off. Better than the school work. Yeah. I'm glad we're out of school for summer. What I like about here is the scenery, the nature, all the birds and stuff. And this uh, river's real calm. Good place just to sit out and hang out and canoe. It's a coastal stream, so it has muddy banks. Grass and trees grow right down to the bank. You usually see a lot of wildlife because of that. Lots of trees. Water. Water. It's good for families. You don't have to be a skilled canoeist or a kayaker in order to enjoy the river. Right now we're just drifting, we're floating on the current. Uh, I go out here every so often. I like the river, but this is the first time I've been like solo kayaking. It's always pretty out here. People love to come here and camp. They spend the weekend here and, and enjoy the float. It's very quiet and serene. The six and a half mile current trail I can make in an hour and a half. Most people take a little over two hours. And we will go pretty close to downtown Goliad, a couple blocks from the courthouse, and you wouldn't know you were near a town. You hear crickets and cicadas and birds, but uh, nothing that sounds like humans. It's a nice, friendly river. Wildlife has always been a passion of mine ever since I was knee high to a grasshopper. I've always liked wildlife, I've always been interested in it, and so it was a natural leap. My name is Ryan Schoenberg. I'm working for Parks and Wildlife for 14 years and the game program for eight. How are you, sir? I hired Ryan several years ago as our big game program specialist. And his focus has been really centered on disease management. So we have chronic waste disease in Texas is a neurological disease that affects all your cervid species, so your deer, elk, moose, the things of that nature. It's very similar to mad cow disease. There is no cure for the disease, so the only prevention is to keep it out of an area. 
The scenarios where we have to go out and collect these samples are extremely stressful, uh, extremely complex. Nobody wants to have to do it. You can imagine these facility owners they have grown emotionally attached to these deer. They've invested a lot of money in these facilities and the deer that are in them. These situations can be really stressful. It's hard on the psyche. It's hard to get that many people together, that many schedules together. One of the more challenging parts of my job is trying to bring a bunch of different entities together for, for the common goals. We want to make sure that we are being as absolute safe as possible. We show up early, we have a little safety briefing and an overview to make sure we have the equipment we need to collect the samples, make sure we have the staff there, make sure we know who's going where and who's doing what safely, humanely, make sure we are getting the research out of it that we need to. I want to be set up there right at daylight. He always has a really strong, motivated team behind him, helping him get very difficult tasks completed under very stressful conditions. Well, my main job in my career is to protect the wildlife. You know, we're protecting the larger good, the, the, all the deer in the state, by trying to sacrificing a few for the greater good. Bottom line, I appreciate everybody's help. He does such a good job of leading by example that he motivates others to work tirelessly through an operation. I've actually received compliments from some of these facility owners thanking Ryan for his professionalism despite the operation that had to be conducted. I think we're ready to go. Grandpa always told me if you find a job you like, you'll never work again. I can't say that every day has been exciting but there's definitely that job satisfaction. There's the ability to go home at night feeling like I've made a difference, however small in my corner of the world. I was born in Dallas. Got to experience the Midwest, the Northeast, quite a few years in Houston. Billy Hassel lives in the urban world. Didn't move back to the area until about 15 years ago. Then I've made Fort Worth home ever since. But Billy has always been drawn to the natural world. Abby. It's hard when you live in a city to find places that are natural. It's dog heaven for them and us too. Reconnecting with nature in a small way in a very urban environment it calms the soul somehow if you can slow down. We live fast-paced lives, and we're kind of conditioned, I think, to think we have to live in rush all the time. But follow Billy to work, and his interest in nature becomes most apparent. Here we are in my studio. I'm a full-time artist. My work has always been inspired by nature. I grew up at a time when there were still some open spaces and creeks, and I got to experience a little bit of nature, even though I grew up in a pretty urban environment. I guess my love of nature was born from those experiences, and I've been kind of searching for that throughout the rest of my life. I've been seeking out opportunities to be out in nature and find places to inspire my work. You see these oak groves from a distance, and they are their sort of own little world. In early fall, a new project finds Billy seeking natural inspiration along the coast. This is a cool spot. This might be a spot to come back to and set up a chair in watercolor. Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation has commissioned Billy to create a series of prints celebrating wildlife habitat conservation statewide. We decided on five land projects around the state of Texas, Powderhorn being kind of the jewel in the crown. Billy's first lithograph will feature Powderhorn Ranch, 17,000 acres of newly conserved coastal prairie and marsh on Matagorda Bay. It's very heartening to me to see large areas of land like this preserved for the future. You had to put it all into one picture. You couldn't fit it all. That's the challenge. Prickly pear and a rattlesnake. The more you look, the more you see. 
<laughs> it is cool to watch them move. I find a lot of inspiration as an artist in a place like this. And as I learn more and more about it, I'm fascinated by the complexities of it and how practically every plant and every little creature plays a role in the overall balance of a place. If I sit down to do a watercolor, I have to sit the chair down, find a spot, commit myself to at least an hour, an hour and a half of time. In a pencil sketch, I can frequently get a, at least a contour of the shadows. The cactus, I got a little more detailed on the shapes, and, and the, the line drawings kind of helped me put it into a bigger context. The length of time it takes to do a watercolor, by the time you're three quarters of the way finished, the light has changed completely. That's the advantage of having a photograph to refer to just for the light and the color. For years, I didn't even own a camera. If I take a picture, I let the camera be the memory. And if I draw it, I think I have to remember it in my head. There's something about the process of visualizing something and processing what you're seeing that burns a more indelible memory. Just being in a place, just walking through a place and hearing the wind blow and seeing things, it seeps in. I try to generate an image that somehow captures the feeling of the place. Yeah, I want a nice warm green. Yeah, pick a color, any color. <laughs> One month That's after easy. his field visit, Billy has an image for his print. So I'm here at Peter Webb's shop in Austin, where we're turning my drawings into a color lithograph. With his printer, Billy builds the image one color at a time. Everything is by hand. He has to basically take his image, deconstruct it, and then reconstruct it. The artist has to draw each and every plate. He's actually drawing the whole print right here. The drawing is transferred by light onto the plate. Traditionally, lithographs were printed from limestone. Aluminum plates have replaced the limestone, but essentially it's the same process that it's been for 300 years. I hate to call it a dying art form, but I feel like by doing the lithographs, I'm somehow keeping an old process alive. So we could take it out later if... Uh... Oh, did I say <laughs> Each color is hand <laughs> inked, hand printed, and usually there are about 12 to 15 colors so that's 15 passes through a press to get one image. All my drawings are done in black and white, so there's this sort of magic thing that happens when we assign colors to each plate and then we combine the colors and we achieve this end result. Each color is printed one on top of another and then when all the colors are printed, you have a finished print. It's a one shot deal. I think it's somehow appropriate to be celebrating these places as a limited edition work of art. Ta-da! <laughs> we did it. There'll be editions of 30, and once they're gone, they're gone. In a way, it is like the land that's inspiring the prints. Back at his studio in Fort Worth, Billy completes other work to be shown with his lithograph. So I'm working on a group of paintings for a show that's going to open in Fort Worth in a couple of weeks. So I've got a few oil paintings that are in progress. Billy's time at Powderhorn has inspired much more than one print. It's kind of evolved into a, almost a whole show of work based on that. I make my gallery owners a little nervous sometimes because I'm down to the wire usually, but I always deliver. <laughs> 
we're at the William Campbell Contemporary Art Gallery here in Fort Worth. Wonderful show. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Tonight is the opening of a show of new paintings and the unveiling of the Powderhorn Ranch lithograph. This has generated quite a stir. Pulled in the crowd tonight. This is kind of the culmination of uh, weeks of work and sweat and anxiety over getting it all done in time. And my only anxiety now is uh, that there's not any wet paint that anybody's going to bump into inside there. I like the one in the back. It's powerful. Yeah. Paintings have sold, and prints have sold, and I think there's going to be a lot of interest in the Powderhorn Ranch lithograph. And I do think people make the association or think about the coastal prairie of Texas and also the fragility of nature. While preserving nature in paint and ink has a beauty all its own, proceeds from Billy's print will also help Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation keep places like Powderhorn Ranch wild forever. When this was proposed to me, I was thrilled. With more lithographs in the series, it'll be about a three-year project. Billy Hassel has more natural inspiration to look forward to. I hope that the prints reach people and make people aware of Powderhorn, but also just aware of the world and how precious it is. This area is, you know, in between two picnic areas. You know, why don't you mow this so that we can walk across there? And what we say is, well, if you don't mind walking around for a couple of years, you know, the native trees will come back. The seedlings are there. We just have to give them an opportunity to grow. First, it was Hurricane Rita in 2005. Then came Hurricane Ike in 2008. Both storms slammed the Texas coast, taking lives, destroying buildings and homes, causing millions of dollars in property damage. Several state parks were hit as well, their beauty altered by a massive loss of vegetation. Today, the land is healing, Despite the destruction, there is new life and ironically, new opportunity to help restore what was once lost. It's hard to believe that it doesn't seem like it's been that long ago. It's still a pretty fresh memory sometimes. David Weeks is the superintendent of Martin Dias Jr. State Park. He's talking about his memory of Hurricanes Rita and Ike and their impact on the park places in this area right here that you could not even see the ground surface. There was so much debris on the ground. Your way in is blocked by the storm debris on the roads that you actually have to stop and physically cut your way into the park. You know, we're out here every day and we take pride in the parks and, you know, to see it damaged, it's not so much discouraging as it is just heartening because you can see out there, if you look out through the woods, how open it is and you also notice that there's quite a few pine trees that uh, are sticking up there that are dead. So those trees were damaged by the storm. Uh, they didn't die immediately but because of bug infestations or uh, dry weather, drought conditions, they died. When Hurricane Rita hit the park, the vegetation was so dense here that falling trees created a domino effect. Two years later, what Rita started, Hurricane Ike finished, creating large open areas that introduced new diversity to the forest. With the overstory gone, all the uh, underbrush and uh, new trees, which is creating the problem with the invasive species, which are like the tallow trees growing right here, and then the dog fennel weeds that are growing up. And we've seen a tremendous growth in our small animal population, as well as our uh, deer population here in the park. 
We have less trees, but we certainly have more wildlife. As far as our visitors, I can't tell you the number of visitors that have come up here after the hurricane and cried because they've been coming here for so many years seeing these big magnificent oaks and magnolias and then all of a sudden there are so many of them down on the ground. In fact, it was those two very species of trees that Hurricane Rita blew down on top of the park's nature center. We had a large red oak hit a magnolia and both of them hit this building and completely totaled this half of the building. We lost a lot of our exhibits inside, uh, some of our books, some of our educational materials. Thanks to my taxidermy friends and a lot of volunteers, we've been able to restock the Nature Center, making exhibits, hands-on activities for kids and adults. We lost anywhere between 35 to 40 percent of our trees from the two hurricanes. Originally, this whole area was part of the big thicket, made up uh, more of longleaf pines than the other two pines that we had. All of this area was completely clear cut right after World War II. So uh, they got all the longleaf pine and left a few of the loblollies. So what came back was loblollies. So when uh, we knew we were going to have to do something with this area, we decided to try to help put it back to the way it was originally. Pretty soon though, say in 25 to 30 years, this area will look like the area with the tall pine trees again. Just down the road and also impacted by Hurricanes Rita and Ike is Village Creek State Park. We are in the big thicket area of Texas and it's known for you know, how thick and lush the vegetation is in this area. And when you get you know, this much sunlight reaching the ground, everything comes up and starts growing. Mother Nature gave park staff here the same opportunity to rebuild the native longleaf pine forest that once dominated this region of Texas. Because of the clearing from the hurricane, it gave us an opportunity to do some resource management uh, in this area a lot easier and faster than we would have normally been able to do it. An area of about 75 acres back here in the south side of the park on this sandy ridge would have been dominated by longleaf pine trees. Uh, but it was mostly overgrown with loblolly pine trees and hardwoods and the hurricane took a lot of those out. Uh, then we came in and mulched the understory, which was about six to eight feet high. Then we followed that with a prescribed burn in the area. The contractor coming in and doing a thinning of some of the remaining loblolly pine trees. We left a few of them, left all the longleaf pine trees here for seed trees, uh, and left a few of the hardwoods. And then the contractor also came back and planted over 25,000 longleaf pine tree seedlings uh, to bring that longleaf back to this area. And about 45 of that 75 acres uh, that we worked on here has been replanted in longleaf pine trees. Before uh, the state bought this property in 79, it had been logged in the 20s and again in the 50s. And so most of the forest was an even aged forest. All the trees were about the same age and that's not natural in a forest. And so when the hurricane came through and took out some of the canopy trees, then you have an uneven aged forest which creates more biodiversity because then you have more different types of plants at different levels which in turn feeds different animals uh, in the ecosystem. So it's a, it's a good thing as far as that goes. It's a bad thing when you know, it destroys people's homes and businesses and things like that. Yes, hurricanes are part of nature and uh, we have definitely come back as a park and we're definitely coming back as a beautiful nature area also. Let Passport to Texas be your guide. Listen to the weekday radio series and encounter fascinating wildlife. <laughs> Explore the diversity of our parks and historic sites. Enjoy the country's best hunting and fishing. Visit PassportToTexas.org to find a station near you. And remember, life's better outside.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.